All right, hello everybody. I'm Brian, uh, part of the Chico Bonsai Club. And um, for those of you who don't know me, I've been a member of Chico Bonsai Society since I think 2005. And uh, I've been collecting trees since about that time as well. So I have, that's probably my main area of experience in bonsai is gathering trees from nature. Although I do um, have some field grown material, nursery stock material and other things that I've created. I do seem to always kind of gravitate towards the collected trees and I've worked really hard to collect trees from nature and kind of um, figure out what works as far as that's concerned. So that's kind of what I'm going to be talking about today. I'll uh, show you some examples of trees in the yards, talk about areas we might collect, um, some of the permissions and possibilities for collecting, uh, how to actually dig the trees, and then maybe talk a little bit about um, potting them up and aftercare as well. So it's kind of the things I was hoping to go over. Um, so welcome to my bonsai garden. Uh, we're in a kind of a small space here, and this is part of the collection. I also have some trees that I just collected in another part of the yard that we might take a look at as well. Um, so uh, just going to talk a little bit about collecting in general. We live in an area where there's a lot of different types of trees that can be collected that make great bonsai. Um, I've collected different species of native pines, junipers, um, a little bit of experience with oaks. Um, mostly I've collected conifers uh, and redwoods. I've done really well with too in the past. Um, so that's mainly the species that I collect. There's other possibilities. Um, lots of different trees, I think just kind of only may be limited by your imagination and what you like to collect. Um, there's aspen, there's sagebrush, um, there are lots of oaks, evergreen and deciduous oaks that uh, would make great species for bonsai and have been collected by other people as well. So kind of interesting to um, figure out what species are available to you and what you might do well with and uh, be able to collect. Um, I uh, generally collect lodgepole pine, Jeffrey pine, Sierra juniper, Utah junipers um, are the main species I've collected. Also a little hemlock. Uh, I've done pretty well with mountain hemlock. Um, where can we collect? It, it, there's lots of different possibilities from private land. Um, you can always try to uh, you may know people with property that live in an area where you might be able to look for species that would work for bonsai. Um, you can also look around, try to get in touch with um, property owners in areas that you've noticed material that might be able to be collected and just ask for permission. Um, I haven't done as much of that, uh, as, but that's certainly a possibility. You could talk to people with ranches, um, ranch land, just natural land, that kind of stuff could definitely have possibilities for collecting bonsai. Um, I have m collected material mostly off of public lands, um, federal and state public lands. Uh, it really varies on whether they will allow collecting, but some of them do have a process for it and will issue you a permit. Uh, it's usually pretty inexpensive. You just have to make some phone calls and um, prepare to explain yourself a few times what you're planning to do because sometimes they have no idea what you're talking about and you have to kind of explain what you intend to do and um, a lot of times they'll work with you on that and issue you a permit. Um, our national forests, uh, some of the national forests will give you permits. I think I've collected on four or five different national forests in California uh, and a lot of them won't. It's actually up to each individual uh, forest manager can set that policy on whether it's something that they'll do. Um, so that's a good place to start. A lot of them already have a, a permit process. You just have to call them and find out what that process is. Um, so yeah, always get permission when you collect. It kind of goes without saying, but um, make sure you're, you have permission to be doing what you're doing or you know, potentially you could be looking at fines for taking tree material. Um, what time of year, I was gonna kind of cover what time of year to collect. I actually just collected uh, at the end of September and October for high mountain areas. That's a pretty good time of year to gather material uh, as they're kind of winding down uh, for winter. And um, spring is always ideal for repotting, but a lot of those high mountain areas would be under such uh, snowpack that you wouldn't be able to dig there in the spring at the time we are usually repotting material here. So fall is generally the time that I've collected trees from the high mountains. Um, 
for redwoods, I collect uh, right around repotting time because you're not dealing with snow issues. So I'll dig in February or March and uh, they've always done really well uh, doing redwoods at that time of year. Um, the other thing was, um, I think who should maybe, who, who would be uh, considering going collecting? I wouldn't recommend going collecting if you're absolutely new to bonsai. Uh, it's something that uh, is difficult for beginners. Transplanting material from the wild is a big shock to the material usually. And you kind of need to have uh, established the basic skills for keeping plants alive and healthy, know how to, you know, the, the correct soils to be using and watering and just kind of gotten some of those basic skills dialed in first. So once you are able to consistently get your trees healthy and growing, uh, you know, th th that's probably a good time to think about um, trying collecting so that you'll be successful. Otherwise, it's, it's kind of pointless to dig up an old tree out of nature just to watch it die because you're not really sure how to care for it. Um, so that's what I would recommend, uh, you know, not as uh, a beginner activity, but something when you're more established. You know, so you, you, you want to go on a trip and uh, go collecting. Um, what kind of supplies are you going to need? What kind of tools are you going to need? And what's that going to look like? That's kind of what I thought I would talk about next. Um, you're going to need a variety of, of digging supplies. Um, I have some good examples. Uh, a shovel is always useful. This is what I've been using most recently is uh, called a root slayer shovel. basically like a trenching shovel but it's meant for cutting roots and it basically has like a blade um, and I sharpen the shovels to actually a pretty sharp point um, it helps cut roots more cleanly and just get through hard spots in the ground so I found that this worked really well this year for digging um, was this shovel you can't always use just a good sturdy shovel this is one I've used before and I also sharpened that one as well um, so that's pretty helpful Um, you're going to be looking at uh, most of the areas that I've collected are, are digging in some dirt and there might be some rocks. Um, some areas that people collect trees grow more in what you would call like a pocket between uh, granite slabs or, or rock outcroppings. And um, that involves a little different techniques of digging, uh, but I tend to find that in our area it's mostly digging out of dirt uh, and removing some loose stones as you go. Um, so it, it's a little bit different techniques and I don't have as much experience with collecting those type of pocket trees. It involves a little more pry bars, um, kind of excavating and then cutting some anchorage roots and actually lifting the whole soil pocket intact. Uh, so it tends to be not what we have in our area immediately around here. It's a little more of digging in dirt uh, with a trench. So that's kind of the, the goal uh, usually when I start digging is to dig a trench maybe um, in, a, in a perimeter out from the trunk that looks like it's going to get you a good root mass. Uh, kind of use the shovel to break ground and start uh, digging a trench around the perimeter of the tree. Um, I took some pictures on the last trip and what that trenching process looks like, um, starting to trench down and kind of um, get a, uh, expose a, a root ball that you're gonna wanna keep intact on the inside of the, the digging perimeter. Uh, So you just work down, uh, gradually uh, use the shovel to break up the ground and start clearing out the dirt from the trench that you're making. Um, that's where I find this other main digging tool comes into use a lot. Uh, it, this or this hand, uh, these hand pick type style uh, digging tools. 
I found I used this one a lot this time, uh, this last collecting trip, just kind of getting in there and clearing out the soil as you go and enlarge the trench. You can kind of scoop this out almost like a shovel or you can kind of hammer into it too and break up more soil as you go, uh, sometimes with this pointed end and then clear it out with this larger end. So I found that tool and my shovel were the most um, helpful for uh, creating the trench around the tree. Um, and you're gonna have to be prepared to dig down pretty deep uh, to be able to lift the tree, probably deeper than you think. Uh So at that point, once you've gone down deep enough, um, you can use the hand tool again, um, maybe this pick or this pick, uh, to start going underneath the tree and actually kind of uh, move in towards where there might be some anchorage roots going on the bottom. As you're creating the trench, you would be cutting any anchorage roots you find uh, with either small cutting tools. I use this a lot, this big bypass pruner. It'll cut up to maybe a, a couple inch root. Um, and anything bigger than that is like a handsaw. You'd have to handsaw through as you're going. And that can be difficult when you're down into a trench trying to cut a big root with the handsaw. But sometimes you do need to use that. So uh, yeah, then when you get down to a deep enough depth, you kind of um, excavate underneath and find more uh, roots anchoring the tree. Um, this is a point that can get, uh, you're close to removing the tree, but it can also be a little bit of a risky point when you're ready to dig the, uh, when you're actually ready to break the tree loose. Because if you have a loose root ball that's not very well attached, uh, the whole thing can just tend to want to fall apart on you as you try to excavate under the tree and break it loose. So something at that point that I found really helpful is to have a roll of movers wrap and actually start wrapping the sides of the root ball. Um, the stuff is pretty stretchy and when it has some stretch and compression to it, it actually puts a lot of uh, compression around the whole root ball. Uh, if you have some wet sphagnum moss uh, on you at that point, which is something I always bring with me and soak in a five gallon bucket before the trip, um, this long fibered sphagnum moss, uh, I'll usually have pre-soaked some of that in a bucket and maybe have a, uh, some in a big black trash bag with me. You can kind of pack that around the roots and then wrap the uh, movers wrap around the root ball and that really helps to secure it and prevent the whole thing from breaking up as you uh, try to break it loose in the next step. So at that point, you know, you've got it kind of secured and you start going underneath the root ball. You can kind of test with your shovel, wiggle a little side to side and see if the whole thing actually um, is uh, wiggling and able to be um, loosened. Usually at that point, you're going to find a few more deep anchorage roots going down. You're going to either have to cut with the bypass pruner or the saw and then um, you can usually break the tree loose at that point. And uh, once you have it loose, uh, get it out of the, the hole that it's in. Uh, I'll usually also get some more sphagnum moss and maybe a, a large black plastic trash bag uh, and kind of wrap the roots in the black plastic uh, and maybe add another layer of movers wrap around the outside to really secure it. I like the root ball to be very well secured so I know it's not gonna break up as I carry it back to the car um, or wherever I'm trying to get to. Um, that's another point to kind of consider is sometimes uh, y you have to think about how far you are away from your vehicle at that point of access because um, a lot of times you can find yourself out pretty far with a pretty heavy tree and it can be pretty difficult to carry it back to the car. Um, there are some different options at that point. I have, I have this hard frame backpack that you could potentially strap uh, a tree to. I think it's meant for like hunting, carrying game out. Uh, so occasionally that will be useful to carry things out. Um, another option is that I've seen people use is a rolling cart, a rolling game cart, which um, would actually maybe be a pretty useful thing. I found myself a couple times this year with trees that were very difficult to um, get out from the area that I'd been digging them and I had to actually drag them out because I couldn't carry them, um, which is pretty difficult. So a uh, rolling game cart might be pretty useful if you think you're gonna be digging trees that heavy. Um, and then, yeah, getting it back to your car uh, and 
usually like a truck or, or van, something, uh, you're gonna need a pretty large vehicle to probably take these trees most of the time um, back home. I have a little pickup truck with four by four and I do get back down some four by four roads sometimes. So just make sure your vehicle is equipped to carry the trees and maybe get access to the areas that you're going into. They're usually in the high mountains or the steep coastal mountains and uh, sometimes that can be, access can be difficult. what do you do with the tree after you get it uh, back home. Uh, you've got to, got to get it into a container in appropriate soil and put it somewhere that it can recover and thrive. So uh, I think the, the most important part of it is to make sure you're putting it in soil that is uh, going to give it its best chance to recover. I use pure uh, pumice. It's just sifted pumice that I get in bulk from uh, Kinney Nursery. Uh, which is out in the uh, uh, Vina area. And it's really inexpensive. You can get a yard of it for like 60 bucks um, or a half yard for you know, 30 bucks. And uh, it'll make a ton of soil. And you just sift it and it um, allows a lot of aeration. It also holds a fair amount of water and it seems to make the roots gr uh, just grow and divide like crazy. Um, it's probably, if I could only have one soil component to grow bonsai in, I'd probably just use pure pumice and I could grow some pretty healthy trees in it. So that's really important. Um, another possibility that I don't really have the space to do here, but it might be a good option, is healing them in in the ground. And uh, you can do that by creating like a, a raised bed uh, of just pure wood chips, like kind of smaller sized wood chips. And um, I've heard people have really good success just healing trees in, in a bed of wood chips. Uh, just making sure they're secured, maybe hammering a piece of rebar in next to the tree and securing the tree to the rebar in the wood chips. And um, I think that would be a, a really good way to recover trees as well. Um, at least as good as the pumice and maybe, maybe even better for trees that don't have a lot of roots uh, might be the best option. Um, so if you are going to put a tree in a container, which is usually what I end up doing, um, you kind of want to plan in advance a little bit about what type of containers you might want to have on hand or um, what you might want to use. You can, uh, I've used a lot of different things. These are some examples of different uh, container options I've used in the past and recently. Uh, it's just like a, a wash tub. Um, just like a commercial grade washing basin. Uh, I think it's a Rubbermaid that I drilled a ton of holes in so it has really good aeration and drainage. Um, I like these because it's just about the right size for a lot of the different trees that I collect. Um, this is a pretty good size and um, it's pretty stiff. It's not totally stiff, but uh, pretty good. You can secure the tree pretty solidly to this. So that's a good option. Um, this is something that Pat uh, had available, at least Pat Gilmore had made available to club members that I used a few times this year for a little bit larger trees. Um, I think it's a uh, drying bin for uh, walnuts or almonds or something like that. Uh, but it also has a ton of drainage and it's pretty stiff and a good dimension. You can actually um, secure trees to this pretty well. So I liked these uh, as an option for securing trees. This is uh, something that I've used uh, before. It's just a cement mixing tub that you can get from Lowe's or the Home Depot. The only thing I would say about this is that it's a little bit flexible. So um, if you do use it, you kind of uh, not only have to secure the root system to it, but probably make some guy wires on all four sides of it and secure it to the upper part of the tree as well. And that seems to help stabilize it quite a bit. And then you would drill a lot of holes in this for uh, drainage as well. Um, I actually used this, this kind of busted up right now because I, I actually used this to drag a couple of trees out from my last trip uh, with like a uh, ra uh, ratchet strap attached to the tree because they were a little heavier than I could carry. So that one's a little broken up, but they're always useful. Um, I think, uh, let's see. And then, yeah, so what I was going to mention was just when whatever container you end up using, you want to make sure the tree is secured really, really tightly to it. Even a small amount of wiggling uh, in the container can really impair the growth of the, the new root tips as they come out. So that's a, that's a big point. Um, I use usually a combination of uh, 
Sometimes I will drive screws into uh, dead wood parts of the trees and then use that to really anchor to the container. Um, sometimes a big cut uh, anchorage root, you can, you can tie down um, right onto that, the cut end of it. Uh, that works pretty well as well. And sometimes you have to use um, guy wires to the top of the tree, maybe in addition to what you did in the container. But whatever you do, it has to be really well secured or it probably won't be able to survive that movement. Um, I have also a wooden box that I've used in the past. Um, wooden boxes are really good in that they uh, you can build it exactly the dimension to the plant that you dug. Sometimes I, I feel like there's no option but to build a custom wooden box because the root systems end up in some weird uh, shapes and dimensions. Sometimes you just can't find uh, some kind of pre-made container that is actually going to work and you have to build a wooden box. Um, but they're a pretty good option. You can always um, secure the tree to the box too because you can run anchorage screws to the box, maybe run a piece of wood up and secure the tree to the, the wood and that really gets them secure in the box. So a box might just be about the best um, kind of container you can use after collection. Um, maybe we could add, the other, the other thing I found important to do after uh, you're preparing to put them in the box is to even take a chopstick um, loosen a little bit of dirt around the edges of the root ball. You, you definitely don't want to be knocking off roots that you collected um, that you worked so hard to, to preserve when you were collecting it. But if you can brush away some of the soil and expose an inch or two of the fine feeder roots, uh, then take a nice pair of sharp scissors or pruners and make all new clean cuts on those roots. Um, that's where those roots are going to want to uh, sprout uh, new root uh, tips from. So that really helps them recover uh, to, clean, to clean the root system up a little bit uh, and cut the root tips uh, before you put it into the pot. Um, after the tree is recovered uh, or secured into the pot, you need to put it somewhere where it can recover and um, selecting a, a, an exposure uh, can be pretty critical um, for placement after, after you collect the tree. I like to pick somewhere um, maybe on the uh, periphery of a big deciduous tree. Um, I've always found to work pretty well or under shade cloth. Um, you definitely wouldn't want to put them generally out in full sun, especially. So mine are in some dappled dappled sun uh, on the side yard and uh, on the ground. I also like to put the trees directly on the ground if possible. We're going to head into winter pretty soon and uh, it's going to help insulate them from those freezes and keep the temperature from fluctuating too much which uh, also is going to really help them recover. I use a lot of foliar misting. Um, I spray the foliage probably a few times a day. Uh, but I try to not overwater the trees because they're not really moving that much moisture. Um, they're a little bit stressed right after being collected and they're not really putting on that much growth. Uh, so you really only need to focus on keeping them just uh, on a little bit damp. Uh, you don't want to let them dry out too much, but uh, you don't want to overwater them uh, immediately after collecting either. I tend to um, at least come back sore and beat up from almost every collecting trip. It's, it's pretty physical. Um, I usually come back with scraped up arms and little cuts and bruises and my hands uh, are pretty beat up for a week or so after. Um, I, I think it's a good idea to carry some knee pads because you're just down on your hands and knees basically chipping away at the root ball. So that's pretty helpful and definitely gloves because your hands will just get really tore up and uh, some super sturdy boots as well for stomping on the shovels and climbing over rocks and uh, it's pretty rugged generally out where we're collecting so protect yourself and um, uh, I was also going to talk a little bit about just being out that far um, it's easy to get lost you definitely have to uh, consider safety when you're out collecting um, I've uh, in the past mostly used maps and just trying to make sure you know the opposite of uh, the direction that you're walking in and whatever turns you've taken that you can kind of retrace your route back to your car. I've actually started using some uh, software called Avenza Maps, uh, A-V-E-N-Z-A. 
and it's just free software. You can pre-download um, maps of areas that you're going into, and if you open the map while you're still in service uh, in a service area, once you enter the map area, you'll appear as a little blue moving dot on it, and you can drop pins for your, where your car was at and uh, where trees were located. So, yeah, just always uh, being safe and make sure you're kind of heads up uh, out where you're collecting trees. Um, so we'll, we can walk around and take a look at some of the trees that um, I've collected over the past couple of years. Um, everything's kind of early in its uh, development, really just in recovery stages, um, since th these trees have all been collected um, since uh, about the past two years. Um, I don't know if any of you saw my trees before, but uh, I'll, my, all my collection was lost in the campfire a few years ago. So kind of rebuilding and I've d been doing a lot of collecting, but it's all freshly collected, not really styled as bonsai yet. So just kind of keep that in mind as we're looking around. But um, this is a, an example of a Jeffrey pine that I collected uh, one year ago and um, up in the uh, high Sierra Nevada mountains. Uh, they're really fantastic trees for bonsai. It's a long needled single flush pine, uh, very similar to Ponderosa, uh, almost uh, difficult to really tell them apart from Ponder Ponderosa. Uh, but they're they're really great. You can see it has really really old bark, some deadwood features, um, very flexible uh, branches that can be wired and styled for bonsai. And this tree came out with such a small root system that I was able to put it directly into a bonsai pot, and it has grown really well in the past year. So I think it's going to do really well for bonsai. Um, let's see. Next to it here is a big. Uh, redwood, uh, coast redwood, that was collected um, a year, about a year and a half ago, I guess. Um, and that's, uh, that came from over on, over on uh, the coast of California. It's, uh, they come out of the ground with no leaves or branches on them, just basically as a stump. So all these branches just sprouted as little twigs. Um, the tree's much taller when we collect it and you cut it down to a, a height that you think you might want to be able to grow a bonsai out of it. And um, they uh, can also come out of the ground with pretty small amount of roots on them to almost no roots. And they develop a whole new root system very quickly. So redwood is pretty forgiving as a bonsai species and it, it really makes a nice tree. Um, in the long run, it'll really fill in with a lot of branching. Uh, you can do a lot of pruning and maintenance on it and it tends to take to wiring really well also. So that's a great species that I've collected a lot of redwoods. Um, we can So um, the, these trees were all just collected in the past month actually on two different collecting trips. Um, one up in the uh, uh, sort of south Lake Tahoe area and another in the central uh, Eastern Sierras and White Mountains that I went on with a group from the Lotus Bonsai Nursery. Um, that I would recommend that trip uh, if you're looking to go on a first collecting trip. That was really my introduction to collecting was with uh, Scott Chad and the Lotus Bonsai Nursery. He, he runs that group every year and I've gone with them probably uh, every other year or so since 2004, 2005. Um, and you can learn a lot on that trip and potentially collect some really great trees. So I'd always recommend um, that as a resource for doing a first collecting trip. Um, this is a lodgepole pine, which comes from the Eastern Sierra, has a short needle. It's another single, plus, single flush pine. And um, it, they just, some of them have great movement. Like this, uh, this tree has, is small, but it's really old. It's got some nice areas of dead wood. Uh, old old bark and uh, they t they're so flexible you can really move these branches almost anywhere you want them to be to make a bonsai out of and they're really fantastic. Um, I probably my personal favorite species to collect is Sierra juniper. Um, I tended to have really good success collecting them in the past. They're very vigorous. They respond really well to being transplanted and they come out with a lot of roots. So I've got a couple examples of Sierra juniper. This is a smaller one that um, has like a multiple trunk, uh, multiple trunks to a nice wide base. And then 
One of the trees I had to actually drag out this year because it's so big. I'm sure if you can, that's uh, got a base that's almost as wide as it is tall. And it's just, I think, a fantastic tree uh, with a lot of dead wood and complicated live veins and just a lot of vigorous foliage. So that's gonna make a really fantastic bonsai. Um, these, this is another species of juniper that I collect. It has tended to be a more challenging tree uh, to transplant successfully. Uh, and um, that's just because they don't have as dense of a root system and the soil they're growing in is very heavy and tends to fall apart when you're collecting it. So uh, these trees this year, I was able to keep a pretty good root ball intact by using that movers wrap um, before I actually lifted the trees. And so I'm hopeful that I'll have better success with that this year. And so these are all Utah junipers over on this end. And they really have fantastic um, deadwood. You make nice bonsai if you can get them to uh, transplant well. This is a really good way of securing uh, kind of what I was describing with the wooden boxes and the um, pieces of wood uh, to make sure your tree's really well secure. I can't even shake that in the pot. It's, uh, it's anchored in so well. Thank you everybody for uh, listening to the talk and hopefully I gave you some good information, uh, maybe got you inspired to, to try collecting and uh, I wish you all the best of luck with bonsai and stay healthy and, uh, and enjoy, enjoy your trees.